August 4th marked 25 years since Lex Luger's WCW title win over Hollywood Hogan on Monday Nitro. They wanted to do something special for the 100th episode of Nitro. It was also the first three-hour episode of Nitro. That from TNT executives who decided they wanted every go-home episode of Nitro before a pay-per-view to be three hours long. And this one did so well that it became a permanent thing in 98. They set a new record that night, a 4.34 rating. Even though they had been building for nearly a year to Sting being the one to take the title from Hogan, Hogan submitted in the torture rack to give Luger the championship. It was a great moment. One of the great all-time moments on WCW Monday Nitro. The whole roster rushed to the ring to celebrate this great victory over the NWO. Great call from Tony Schiavone and Mike Tenay. I remember the celebration in the back and the giant using paint thinner to try to wipe off the NWO spray paint from the belt. Luger was as hot as anybody in the company at that time. I've seen people argue over the years that Lex Luger sucked and he was never over. My guess is that these are fans who only watched his WWE run. WWE was the only place where Luger was not massively over. He was popular in his NWA days. He was popular in the early WCW days. And he was over after he came back to WCW, especially in 97. And so was his torture rack finish. He didn't have much time to enjoy his title win, though, because he lost it right back to Hogan five days later. Lex Luger has been through a lot in the 25 years that have passed since that night. And his A&E biography covered all of the ups and downs last Sunday. A very good episode. The closest that we may ever get to that Icons episode that got yanked from Peacock last year, which is not what this was. I'm sure there's a lot of overlap and a lot of crossover, They probably look very similar, but this was not the Icons episode. This was a separate thing that A&E put together. The main thing I got from the first half of this thing was that he was a real arrogant SOB. Everybody went out of their way to talk about how cocky he was and how full of himself he was, but it was okay because he looked like a million bucks. Everybody agreed he had the best body In all of pro wrestling. And even before he got into wrestling. They talked about his football days. The main takeaway was what a great body he had. It's all about his body. And it's true. Luger had one of the greatest physiques of any wrestler that I've ever seen. I could see why Vince McMahon wanted to make him the next Hulk Hogan. His mistake was. He should have taken his time with it. Let it. You know, run longer as a heel, let him go as the narcissist longer than he did, and eventually he turns and has this great run as a babyface without all of the All-American stuff, which did not suit him well at all. He didn't let Lex be himself. That's why it failed. He was trying to be something that he wasn't. But the star of the episode was Luger's body. It's all anybody talked about. What they did not talk about was how he cheated those drug tests in the WWF. See, that would have been interesting to hear him talk about it. Like, because he's been open about it in other interviews. They didn't get into it here. You know, when Lex came in to WWE, Vince McMahon was very serious about drug testing because he knew the government was watching. They were breathing down his neck. So he had to be extra careful because he knew there was heat on him. That's why a lot of guys shrunk around that time or they just left the company. Yet Luger came in and he maintained his physique. He came in and he looked as jacked as ever. Now, I know he was a gym rat, but I mean, come on. How is it that everybody else looks smaller, but Lex was able to maintain his size and look all cut? Come on, because he would sneak in fake urine samples. Or he would mask the drugs in his actual urine by coating his fingers in Visine and dipping his fingers into the sample. They went on and on about his physique, but they never got into any of that stuff. That's, that's some stuff I think people would have found interesting. But you know, one thing I learned uh, many years ago, I forget who it was who said this. It might have been Shane Helms. I want to say I want to say it was Hurricane. He said that he saw Lex eating Reese's peanut butter cups once before a photo shoot, and he asked him why. Why are you why are you eating that? Look at the way you look. Why are you eating Reese's peanut butter cups? And Lex told him, he goes, It's the sugar. It helps with your vascularity. It helps make your it makes your veins pop out more. 
So before he would have a photo shoot, he wanted to look his best, have veins bulging from every part of his body. He'd be standing off to the side having, you know, three Reese's peanut butter cups or however many of them there were. And then he would be, you know, a few minutes later, he'd be ready to go take his shots. And I never knew that before, but it always stuck with me. So if I should find myself one day at a photo shoot where I have to take my shirt off and God help those people if that day ever comes, I will make sure that I have some Reese's peanut butter cups on me. That and I will tie some tassels around my arms like the Ultimate Warrior to make my biceps look bigger than they really are. But they covered his time with the Four Horsemen right up to Ric Flair leaving for the WWF and taking the big gold belt with him which put Luger and Barry Windham in a very tough spot. Because people wanted to see Flair. The match was supposed to be Flair and Luger. And Flair had no issue dropping the title to Luger. But what he did have a problem with is he wanted to be paid back on the deposit that he had put down many years earlier for the belt. Plus all the interest that had accrued. And that's when Jim Hurd told him, you know, basically, you know, go fuck yourself. And Flair called up Vince McMahon and said, hey, I got this belt here. You want me to send it up to you? Vince is like, sure, go ahead, mail it to us. So what they did was they made Luger the champion and they 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 rigged up this really bootleg looking belt because it was very short notice. And they did Luger and Barry Windham in a cage and Luger became the champion and it just did not work. It just didn't work. Business at the time was a mess for both companies, not just WCW. WWF business was not exactly great either. Uh, They had some WBF footage in here that I had never seen before. The plan was for Luger to join Vince's bodybuilding federation. The initial plan was not for him to go right to the WWF. uh, Because Lex still had a year left on his WCW contract. That was, in their mind, their way around it. He's not wrestling for the WWF. He's doing bodybuilding for Titan Sports. And they did not mention this in the special, but WCW filed a lawsuit against Luger over that whole thing. Uh, All of this was rendered moot when Lex got in the infamous motorcycle wreck that almost killed him. That was right before he was to have made his WBF debut, which he never did. And it was a very bad accident. His arm was completely mangled. Sting, who still to this day is one of Lex's best friends, he talked about... Uh, And boy, you know, when you see Sting in these specials, and look, Sting still looks good for his age, but I always say, like, how is it that Sting looks so good when he's out there in the ring and you have other wrestlers who are in their late 50s, you know, even younger than him, or or, or they're in their 60s and they look every bit of it. I'm telling you, I mean, the face paint, I, I don't think enough people realize how beneficial it is to be wearing face paint like Sting does. Because he wasn't wearing paint in this special and I'm looking at him and I'm going, yeah, that looks like a 63 year old guy. But you don't notice it on TV. It's like, oh, okay, you notice it with the hair and how it's all, you know, thinned out and everything. But but Sting was interviewed uh, as part of this special, and he and Lex are still, to this day, uh, very good friends. And Sting talked about walking into the hospital room as they were unwrapping the bandages on his arm. And you can see the actual bones sticking out. You can see, you know, the, the underlying layers of of flesh and it was just like a horror show and the doctors wanted to amputate his arm and Lex told Sting don't let him do it don't let him do it so Sting called Dr. Jim Andrews who has operated on dozens and dozens of wrestlers over the years various injuries muscle tears knee injuries arm injuries Sting happened to have the guy's pager back when those were still a thing and Andrews got right back to him and told him get Lex down to me and I'll I'll look at him. I'll take care of him. So they saved the arm. But he came very close to losing the... And even Andrews told him, you came very close to losing the use of your right arm. But it worked out perfectly. Because this would have happened in June, I believe, of 92. He wouldn't be able to legally wrestle for Vince anyway until early 93. So all those months off, he used them to heal up from his injuries. And when he finally debuted, it was at the Royal Rumble... In 1993, Bobby Heenan unveiled the Narcissist, who at first they called him Narcissus, and then Narcissus became the Narcissist. So that's what they called him at first, and he would knock out his opponents with the loaded forearm, which had all the nuts and screws in it from the surgery. He did not even get a full six months 
as the narcissist before they did the body slam challenge on the intrepid it was july 4th the stars and stripes challenge i was not there i told my parents i wanted to go and for whatever reason we didn't go i have been on the intrepid before the museum there the thought of having a wrestling event on there was just it was so cool to me it's it's still cool to think about the fact that we had a wrestling event on the uss intrepid and they had a bunch of different wrestlers and NFL guys, NBA players, NHL players, they were all trying to slam Yokozuna. Yokozuna was the big foreign menace, and the idea was who can pick the big guy up and slam him and save the United States, I guess, from, I don't know, is he fucking Godzilla? Was he going to go stampeding through the country? I have no idea. Yoko was just dead waiting all of them. Bill Fralick almost got him up. Crush almost got him up. Nobody could do it. Tatanka, the Steiner brothers, Bob Backlund, the Macho Man, nobody could get this man up. Until suddenly, off in the distance, we see the helicopter. And what's funny is when the fans first saw the chopper landing, they all chanted, Hogan! <laughs> but it was not Hulk Hogan, it was the Narcissist. Only he wasn't dressed as the Narcissist, he was wearing this red, white, and blue shirt. And he confronts the evil foreign menace, and it's like a scene out of a cheesy 80s movie. I will say this. When Vince McMahon believed in an idea, he put everything into it. The Intrepid, the Chopper, the Lex Express. This guy went all out. So then came the Body Slam, which was more of a hip toss. But he did it, and everybody cheered, and they had an instant top new babyface in the company. I mentioned the Lex Express. They put this guy on a fucking bus for five or six weeks, traveling the country right up to his match with Yokozuna at SummerSlam at the end of August. I know he had his kids on there with him. I think that was probably only for a few days. So for the most part, you know, he's away from his family. They had great behind-the-scenes footage, which is one of the things I love about these biographies. We, we've gotten to see some behind-the-scenes footage that we've never seen before where you could see how irritable he was on some days. He complained about losing 10 pounds during the whole bus tour. I'd be cranky also if they put me on a bus for over a month and they had me shaking hands and kissing babies, you know, which is not something that he really cared to be doing. Everybody to a T. Jim Cornette was interviewed for this. All these people that knew Lex or knew of Lex said, that was not Lex Luger. Lex Luger was not a people person. Lex Luger was not the kind of person who would embrace doing autograph signings and meet and greets and... You know, again, doing some of the other stuff where he would go visit, uh, you know, uh, underprivileged kids or whatever, whatever they had the guys doing at that time. It just wasn't him. And people at the time who knew him laughed at the idea of him even doing that type of stuff. There was one scene where he was at an autograph signing. He's sitting at a table and some fan behind him must have said something about WCW because all of a sudden Lex turns around and he says, I don't want to hear anything about that WCW crap. So keep your mouth shut. <laughs> he turned back around to keep signing. Hell of a baby face. Bruce Pritchard rode that bus with Lex for the first week. And he said that he realized quickly that this may not be the right guy. Then we get to SummerSlam. Lex Luger against Yoko Zuna. After the Intrepid and the bus tour and all those weeks of promotion that he's going to take back the championship for the good old U.S. of A. He knocks Yokozuna out of the ring and he wins the match by countout. Not only did he win by countout, but he never even made any attempt to try to get the guy back in the ring. He gleefully counted along with the referee. The title does not change hands on a countout. It's a pinfall or submission decision only. Everybody in the audience knew that. Evidently, Lex did not. And what made him look like even more of an idiot is that Jim Cornette had the stipulation added that if Lex failed to win the championship, he could never get another title shot. So think about this. The man is perfectly content to take the countout victory knowing full well that if he does not win the championship, he can never again challenge for it. This was the night that the Lex Luger push officially died. I'm not saying that it would have worked. I think if he would have won the title, 
they would have ended up putting the belt back on Bret Hart by WrestleMania anyway, because Bret was more over than Luger was. We would have ended up with Lex Luger headlining for the entire fall and winter against Ludwig Borga. <laughs> and business would have tanked even more than it did. We ended up with Yokozuna and The Undertaker having a program which, actually from what I can remember, did pretty good business. And I cannot really explain why, but I kind of liked it. I remember liking it when I was you know, a, a younger fan watching that. I enjoyed the stuff with Undertaker and Yokozuna. I thought they worked well together. But my God, to build it up the way that they did and not only have him fail, but fail in such spectacular fashion and make him look like a blithering idiot. It's almost like they were trying to sabotage him. If you did not know any better, you would almost think they were trying to sabotage this guy. But the thing is, they weren't. They really weren't. They really wanted him to succeed. They spared no expense to push this man to the moon. But Vince McMahon wanted to drag it out. He wanted to drag the chase out all the way to WrestleMania 10. He figured that it would be a bigger moment for him to win the championship in Madison Square Garden. But it, it backfired. You know, what happened is when, when Hogan went away, they thought that they would still have Hogan. Hogan ended up leaving and they were left scrambling. And if they just took their time and they didn't rush right into it, maybe things would have worked out a little bit differently. SummerSlam 93 was the death of the All-American Lex Luger. That one booking decision sealed his fate. All the other wrestlers coming out to celebrate, hoisting him up on their shoulders, balloons and confetti falling from the sky. 11-year-old Sala Monster, even before he became cynical and jaded, knew how fucking stupid this all was. So they covered his jump from WWE back to WCW. Once Luger failed to win the title of WrestleMania, and it was clear that they were going with Brett as their top babyface, he just sort of floundered. I remember the angle with Tatanka, where they tried to make it seem like Lex had sold out, and he was going to join the Million Dollar Man, and Lex kept denying it, and Tatanka kept calling him out on it. How come we saw you in his locker room? How come we saw you talking to DiBiase? You're taking the money. Luger denied it for weeks, and the swerve was that it was Tatanka. He was the one who took the money. And yet again, Lex was left looking like a fool, because it was pretty obvious where that angle was headed. <laughs> and yet, Lex Luger was the only man who apparently didn't know what was going on, and he got beat down, and they, they stuffed the money in his mouth. They should have renamed him Lex Loser, because that's what he was. In 95, they put him and the British Bulldog together as the Allied Powers. There's no way Luger could have been happy with this spot. By the time 95 rolled around, there is absolutely no way that Lex Luger could have been happy with the position that he was in. Bruce Pritchard in the episode says that they tried to have Lex sign a new deal numerous times and he kept putting it off and that he wouldn't sign. So there is no doubt in my mind that Lex wanted out. He wanted to go back to WCW. Luger heard that, by the way. He went on Busted Open Radio this week to refute what Bruce had to say. He says he likes Bruce and, you know, he gets along with him now, but Bruce has a way of being sarcastic and that's not really how it went down. According to Luger, he went to Vince and he said, look, my contract is up. I've given my 90-day notice. I want to stay. And he says Vince wanted him to stay too. And Lex said, look, I want to be able to do outside non-wrestling stuff also. Like fitness stuff, nutrition stuff, for extra money. Basically, Vince would own his wrestling rights, but would let him do outside stuff. And Luger was working without a contract. And he said Vince just, he dragged it out. He seemed receptive to it at first, maybe. But he just, he dragged this out for months. And he kept on working without a contract this entire time. Just a handshake deal because... He and Vince got along great. He thought he had a great relationship with Vince McMahon. And finally, Vince let him know, look, if I do this for you, then I have to do it for other people. I have to do it for Shawn Michaels, and I, I have to do it for everybody. And it was at that point that Lex said, oh my God, he's, he's not going to let me do this. And that's when he had a conversation with Sting, his old buddy. He talked to the Stinger. And he told Sting, look, I'm not working without... I'm I'm working, rather, without a contract. And Sting couldn't believe it. He goes, what? Because, yeah, I'm working without a contract. And Sting is the one who went to Eric Bischoff to lobby for Lex to come back. Bischoff was not interested at all. He did not like Lex. He thought that Lex was an arrogant jerk, which 
I mean, pot meat kettle. Bischoff made a low ball offer. He says, I'll, I'll, out of respect to Sting, I will make him an offer. But he intentionally made it a very low offer with the thought that there's no way Lex is going to accept this. There's no way Lex's ego will allow him to accept this. And he offered him a deal for $150,000 a year. This for a guy who was making half a million a year the last time he worked for WCW. And to his surprise, Luger accepted the offer. So when Luger says that I planned on re-signing with WWE right up until the very end, I have my doubts about that. Because there's just no way that he could have been happy with his spot. Even Sting in the episode says that he was miserable there. The fact that Luger took 150 grand a year, no negotiations or anything, just, yes, I'll take it. You're going to tell me he wanted to stay in WWE? You buy that? He couldn't wait to get the hell out of there. But I do think he had a good relationship with Vince and he, he wanted to try to do right and not burn any bridges, but he just he just had to get out. So I'm actually more inclined to uh, believe Bruce on this. So I can't believe I just said that, but I'm inclined to believe Bruce more on that than, than Lex. Although I will say, you know, WWE playing the victim. It's always hilarious when WWE plays the victim. Them playing the victim like they were totally blindsided by this. Couldn't see it coming. It was reported in The Observer in August that Sting was trying to get Bischoff to bring Luger back. And believe me, they read The Observer. This was back during the period where, where Vince would meet with Meltzer and Keller. Have actual meetings with them, not just phone calls. Howard Finkel would put together the Finkel Report and he would present it to everybody in the, in the boardroom meetings as far as what's being talked about in the dirt sheets and the rag sheets. So yes, they had to know that something was going on. And if Luger was working without a contract for months on end, that's on Vince, that's not on Lex. They were certainly booking as if they expected him to stay. They, they started the storyline with Bulldog. Remember the British Bulldog went heel? They had Lex Luger interfere in the SummerSlam main event with Diesel and Mabel. I think Diesel attacked him when Lex was trying to make the save for him with the idea of, you know, Diesel doesn't know if Lex is on his side or is he still with the Bulldog. Because the Bulldog heel turn, I want to say the Bulldog heel turn happened the week before SummerSlam. And so that was kind of the story they were going for. Lex had been partners with Bulldog, so what's his agenda coming out here? Is he with me? Because Bulldog had already turned on Diesel in an angle, so Diesel beat him up because he didn't know. And at In Your House the very next month, Bulldog ended up wrestling Bam Bam Bigelow in a totally random match. I am sure the original plan was to do Bulldog against Luger on that show, but Luger left. I just don't know how they could have been so blindsided by what he did. Nobody should have been surprised that Lex Luger wanted to leave that company. Unless you're Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard, apparently. The timing for Bischoff was perfect, though, because they were launching Nitro from the Mall of America, so to have Luger show up as a surprise, that was a big coup for them. It set the tone for the Monday Night War. Luger showing up on that first Nitro, that was the first shot fired by WCW. Then they got into his relationship with Elizabeth. And his downward spiral. He got very heavy into the drugs and the alcohol, as did Elizabeth. Whether she was already doing that stuff before she started dating Lex, that we don't know. It sounds like, and he even admits, look, I probably was a bad influence on her. But she was also doing things that she should not have been doing. And she was a grown adult, and so, you know, that's, that's also her responsibility. Uh, they were both married at the time. They secretly were dating. In fact, when she died, she was with Lex in his secret townhouse on the other side of town from where he and his wife lived. Two weeks before she died, a neighbor heard shouting from their home. And this was not covered in the episode. But a neighbor heard shouting from their home and called the cops. Uh, they glossed over this. Again, they didn't mention any of this. There was one quick screenshot of a police report that showed... Luger was charged with battery, but they quickly moved on, and again, nothing was actually said about it. But when the cops got there, they found Liz with a cut lip, a bump on her head, and she had two bruised eyes. 
which both of them insisted was from a dog walking accident where the dog leashes got tangled up. This was like a week before and she fell and he was charged. He ended up being released on bond. He admits that they argued, but he has no idea what would have prompted the neighbor to call the cops. I, I have no idea why the neighbor would have felt the need to call the cops. We were just having an argument. He said that she was crying from the argument, not because he put his hands on her. He has always denied, as open as Lex is now about his issues, uh, he has always denied that he ever put his hands on Elizabeth. Two days after this incident, by the way, he got busted for DUI and for driving with a suspended license. So he was not exactly in a good state of mind at that time. Excuse me if I have always found the dog walking accident story to be complete bullshit. But it was May 1st, 2003, when Elizabeth died from mixing Xanax and vodka. He was heating up dinner in the microwave. He told her, you know, eat before it gets cold. And he noticed that she was, I think she was on the couch and she wasn't moving. And they played the audio of the 911 call that he made. He was panicking. He had no idea what to do. He was begging for somebody to help her. And she ended up dying. And it was ruled an accidental death. I remember WWE did a whole story on it on their confidential TV show. They were playing the 911 tape. They were exploiting the whole thing for, to try to pop a rating. They were going out of their way to try to make it sound like Luger basically murdered her. And he now admits that he does feel guilty that he was a bad influence on her and he may have contributed to her downfall, but it was ruled an accident. And he was never charged with killing her. The cops did find all kinds of drugs and steroids in his home. They charged him with 13 counts of drug possession. They fined him $1,000. They sentenced him to five years probation. It is amazing, isn't it, when you, you hear stories about people who are incarcerated for various drug offenses just think of the fact that in this country right now, there are people sitting in jail. They are sitting behind bars for being caught with a tiny amount of marijuana. And now, of course, you know, they're, they're legalizing marijuana in a lot of different states. But there are still to this day people who are sitting in jail for a tiny amount of marijuana. Lex, Luger's, <laughs> Lex Luger gets caught with all this shit, basically a fucking pharmacy in his home. And he gets five years probation. But he only got worse after that. More arrests for DUI and, and just going down a very bad road. And he ended up behind bars. And that is where he met the prison chaplain who he says changed his life forever and led to his, I guess you would say, religious awakening. And he finally started to turn his life around. They talked about the spinal stroke that caused him to end up in a wheelchair. It is very jarring, you know, to see this man who once looked like a, a statue. He looked like a Greek god, chiseled out of granite, always known for his physique. Now in a wheelchair, looking so thin and so frail. But there's a good reason for that. He was on an airplane. This was in 2007. And the way that he turned his neck had basically cut off the flow of blood. And it caused massive swelling that resulted in his being paralyzed from the neck down. It wasn't until uh, he got to, I think, his hotel room or whatever, and he just sort of collapsed on the floor because he was paralyzed. From the neck down, he couldn't move. And he was supposed to be paralyzed for the rest of his life and need 24-hour round-the-clock care. But he made enough of a recovery that he can move now, even though he still uses a, a walker or a wheelchair, he can get up and walk around for a little bit if he wants to. He describes it like the power going out in a storm. How that could happen to him, you know, at any moment. And then when it does, he'll end up on the floor. So he has to take precautions if he's going to walk around, you know, his house or whatever. But he lives totally independently. He doesn't have a live-in nurse or anything like that. He lives totally independently, which was never supposed to happen. And when the episode is over, you know, you're left with this feeling that this is a redemption story for someone who went down such a dark hole. You never expected him to climb out of it. So many of his friends and people he worked with had similar types of issues and they're dead. They're six feet under. But Lex was able to crawl his way out. And here he is now. He comes across as humble. He's very self-reflective. 
He admits to most of his mistakes. He's always got a smile on his face. He's got such a positive attitude about things, despite all of the physical challenges that he's gone through. It's still a depressing story to see that, you know, this is how Lex Luger, you know, ended up. And it's sad that to this day, he has no relationship with his children. They want nothing to do with him, which is understandable. He's hopeful one day that might change. He was asked at a Sports Illustrated interview last week, not if, but when he is inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, do you think that the fans might see you walk on stage to accept the honor? And he says he might pop out of the chair for that. If, if the moment comes that he is inducted into the Hall of Fame, he says he would take that chance and try to get up out of his wheelchair. But the man definitely had a Hall of Fame career. You can't deny that. He did not achieve the kind of success they expected him to in WWE. But Luger will go down as one of the biggest names in wrestling in the 80s and 90s. And that is the period that is remembered most fondly by wrestling fans. So I think he'll be in one day. Now that Vince is gone, it's going to be very interesting to see what names go into the Hall of Fame that maybe would not have gotten in before. I would love to see them acknowledge referees. We lost two big ones within 48 hours of each other this year. Dave Hebner and Tim White. Let's show some love for the men in stripes. They have an important job also. They don't get enough respect for what they do.